Well, good morning. Um, I have the, you guys hear me okay? I have the privilege this morning of introducing our, our guest speaker. If you were able to attend our conference this weekend, we did a conference on Friday night and Saturday morning called Seasons of Sorrow with Tim Challies, and I think many of you are familiar with him, but Tim is a, a, a man who's been blogging and writing for about 20 years. Uh, he is originally from Ontario. He's an elder at Grace Fellowship Church in Toronto there where he serves faithfully, uh, ministering and shepherding the people. And he is his wife. He's been married to Aileen for 25 years, okay? And they have two kids, uh, two daughters, and then one son who's, who's in heaven now. And um, the loss of that son led them to kind of open up their lives and Tim to write a book called Seasons of Sorrow and share just what it was like to go through the pain of the loss and, and, and so that others who have gone through that as well could learn from that. And I think we would all say, if you were at the conference, we learned a lot, didn't we? It was very much a blessing. I would encourage you, if you didn't get a chance to hear that, you want to go online when it's available. I think it would be very beneficial to you. Where We did three sessions, or Tim did, and then we did a Q&A with them to kind of talk a little more about the personal angle of what that was all like. But we've asked him to come preach for us this morning, open up the Word of God. And so uh, without any further words on that, I would invite Tim to come on up and, and preach for us. Good morning. It's a joy to be with you once again, at least those of you who are at the conference. It was a, a blessing to me to be able to be among you and to meet so many like-minded brothers and sisters in the Lord. What a blessing that we can travel far and wide, and wherever we go, we meet brothers and sisters and know that we worship the same God in much the same way, and that's just a huge encouragement. You can take out your Bible and turn once again to the book of Second Kings, and as you do that, I'd like to introduce you to a, a big man, a mighty man, a big and mighty man who lived about 2,500 years ago in the nation of Syria, ancient Syria. That's a nation that's just to the north of Israel. And this man's name is Naaman. And at the time we meet him in the book of 2 Kings, he's already become one of the heroes of his generation. He's already become one of the mighty warriors. He's become one of the great military commanders. It's the kind of man who has everything he's ever wanted, everything he ever set his heart upon. There's just one little problem. And the problem is he also has one thing that he never wanted, one thing that he only ever lived in fear of. So in 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 1, we read, Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. I'm reading from the ESV. Your translation may be a little bit different. It may have a different place name, Aram, which is actually just a region in Syria. So it may be like saying he was from Ontario or he was from Canada. Both are true, and the same would be true here. Uh, the ESV, which I'm reading from, ascribes him to the nation. Your translation may ascribe him to the region. This morning, I want us to spend some time getting to know this man, Naaman. I want us to see a big man and a little girl and the contrast between them. I want us to see a faithless king and a faithful prophet. And best of all, I want us to see a kind and powerful God. I want us to see a powerful God who loves to heal those who are broken and wounded and diseased. Before we can see that, we need to see a big man and a little girl. And so Naaman is introduced to us in this passage as this big and powerful man. Just in the first verses here, we learn that he is a commander, that he is great, that he's favored, that he's mighty, that he's known for his valor. Everything seems to be going his way. Everything seems to be going his way except for that one word that comes at the end of his little biography, which is he is a leper. When the Bible speaks of leprosy, it can refer to a number of different diseases, but whatever he has, it's a skin condition. And whatever he has, it's embarrassing, it's visible, and it's most likely fatal, very possibly disfiguring, the sort of thing you see in a person. It's the kind of disease that when other people see it, it evokes horror in them. Pity, sure, but horror 
as well. It makes them want to just stay far away lest they come in contact and end up getting it as well. So I think it's like the author is kind of posing a question here. So it's great that you're valor, valorous, Mr. Naaman, but what does that valor really mean when your body is covered in these open, painful, weeping sores? It's great that you've got the admiration of the people, that's a good thing, but what does it matter when those people are afraid to even approach you, to even come near to you? And what will all of that fame and what will all of that notoriety, what will it do for you when that disease finally claims the victory and you're just laid in a tomb? And it should make you ponder, what will your accomplishments do for you when you approach the end of your life? If you've lived to be famous, what will your fame do for you when you contract a fatal disease? I mean, maybe thousands of people will attend your funeral instead of just a handful, but is that really meant to be comforting? Or if you've lived to be rich, what will your money do for you when you take your last breath? I mean, does it, does it really matter if in the end you're buried under a big slab of marble or a big slab of concrete? Either way, you're, you're dead, you're in the ground. There's nothing wrong with accomplishments, not at all, nothing wrong with accomplishments. But you should stop to ask, what will they actually do for you as you encounter illness? What will they do for you as you approach death and as you pass from this life into whatever comes next? So the story introduces us to this big man, this complicated big man. And then it introduces a little girl in verse 2. Now the Syrians on one of the raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel and she worked in, in the service of Naaman's wife. And so we learned that at some point the, the army of Syria had raided Israel and carried off whatever they could capture, gold, silver, cattle, even people. So it might have happened something like this. This little girl, little Jewish girl was sitting in her family's home and she heard the sound of an army approaching and her father screamed at her to run and hide and she heard the sound of a battle outside and maybe she heard the sound of her parents pleading for their lives. A soldier burst in and found her and snatched her up and took her away. Little girl. This little girl is carried off to Syria, to this foreign land. She's got no home. She's got no family. She's got no friends. She's got no rights. This little girl is forced to be a servant, a slave to this big man. I think some days we can grow accustomed to reading the Bible and just missing out on the sheer horror of words like that. One day she hears, she, she's in service to Naaman's wife, and she hears people talking about Naaman's terrible disease. And I guess it triggers a memory somewhere deep in her mind. She remembers that when she was back in Israel, back with her people and her land, she had heard that God had raised up a prophet. She heard people talking about this prophet. She heard them say that God was working through him to do some amazing things, to do some miraculous things. And so in that moment, she needed to decide what would she do with this information. Again, we need to remember there had been a terrible, unspeakable tragedy in the life of this little girl. We can't overlook that. Her family was probably destroyed in the raid, and then she was carried off by the army that slaughtered her family, and then she was enslaved by the man who commanded that army, who gave them their orders, who had told them to do that very thing. So you think her natural temptation in this moment then would be to kind of rub her hands in glee and just watch him die, right? It serves him right. You treat me like that, this serves you right. But instead of being bitter and angry, and instead of withholding information, she chooses to speak up. Verse three, she said to her mistress, if only my Lord were with the prophet who's in Samaria, he would cure him of his disease. So this little girl loves her enemy. Tiny little girl, she loves her enemy and she tells him how to be cured. She tells him how to be saved. And it reminds me that God loves to do big things through even little people. A small child who knows God is far wiser than an old man who denies him. The words of a little child, even the smallest child, can have great power when that child's speaking about our mighty and powerful God. And I think for all of us, there are times we can feel like children. 
I mean, we're all grown up, we've moved on in life, but we can still feel like children. And maybe that happens when our beliefs are being challenged by people whose intellect or education or whatever it is is far greater than our own. They, they know more, they're better read, they, they have great confidence in what they believe or what they don't believe. So we can feel like children compared to some of those skeptics or compared to some of those atheists or compared to people who really know other religions. But we need to know that if God can speak through a child, he can speak through you. So don't be afraid to speak in those moments. You've got truth on your side. You've got God on your side. So don't discount what God can do through people who seem so little and so small and so powerless. We've seen a big man and a little girl. Now we're going to meet a faithless king and a faithful prophet. So this little girl tells Naaman's wife what she knows, and Naaman's wife quickly rushes to her husband and tells him what this girl has said. This must sound pretty unlikely. I mean, honestly, he hears from this little girl that there's a man who can cure diseases, but I guess he's desperate enough to give it a try, right? He's tried everything else. But there's a problem, of course. He can't just cross into Israel without causing a ruckus, right? This is the guy who's been going into Israel, invading the nation, snatching up little children and making them his slaves. He can't just go in now and ask them for a favor. So Naaman goes to the king. He goes to the king and he says what we find in verse four. Thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. In other words, he says, this kid says there's a guy in Israel who can heal me. And the king of Syria decides, well, this is probably worth a shot. Right? Naaman's my number one guy, my number one general. I really want him to continue to serve me, continue to win battles on my behalf. He's had great success. I want him to have more success. And so the king thinks this is worth a shot. And what he does is he prepares a letter to the king of Israel. So verse 5. The king of Syria said, go now and I'll send a letter to the king of Israel. And so we went, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 changes of clothing. That would be several million dollars anyways. Verse 6, and Naaman brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, when this letter reaches you, know that I've sent to you Naaman my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Only consider and see how he's seeking a quarrel with me. All right, let me explain what's happening there. It's maybe a little opaque, people speaking in the way they spoke several thousand years ago. I'll explain what's happening. Essentially, the king of a very weak nation, it receives a letter from the king of a very strong nation. And that letter says, I've sent you millions of dollars and in return, I need you to heal this guy of his leprosy. There's a transaction here. The problem is that the king of Israel knows that he has no ability to cure anyone of anything whatsoever. And so his assumption is that there's got to be some kind of a trick here. What he assumes is that the king of Syria is trying to manufacture an incident, that he's trying to do something that will then give him permission or give him ability to declare war on Israel. And so as a sign of the king of Israel, as a sign of his grief, as a sign of his confusion, he tears his clothes. It's a weird custom to us, but it's one you read about often in Scripture, especially in the Old Testament. When you're grieved, when you're confused, when you're downcast, you tear your clothes. So we're about to meet that faithful prophet, but before we do that, it's, it's worth asking, what should the king of Israel be doing at this point? He's in a scary situation, no doubt. I mean, he misunderstands the situation, but he's terrified, and understandably so. He's afraid, and he's intimidated because there's this enemy that's much stronger, much more powerful, much more able than he and his nation are. So what might be a better response to the situation than shredding his clothes? Well, the better response would be to ask God for help. Because even if Syria does intend to attack, I mean, even if he's got it right and that's what's going to happen, he should know that God has proven himself against much greater odds in the past. Right? This is the God who destroyed an entire Egyptian army in the Red Sea. 
This is a God who flattened the walls of Jericho with nothing but a trumpet blast and a, a shout. This is a God who scared off the army of Midian with basically just the sight of torches and the sound of jars breaking. This is a God who's proven his power, who's proven his willingness to help his people. And so the king should be humbling himself in prayer rather than cowering in grief. He should be tearing apart his pride, not shredding his clothes. He should be trusting the might of God rather than fearing the power of Syria. And it makes me wonder, what, what's your first instinct when times of trouble come? What's your first instinct when you come into this time of deep uncertainty? You probably don't tear your clothes apart, I would imagine, but you tear your life apart through anxiety. Do you tear your joy apart through desperation? Do you tear your faith apart by unbelief or by just raging against God? I think one of the hardest but the most important lessons we ever learn as Christians is to bring all of our cares to the Lord, right? To learn to go to the Lord first rather than last, to, to tell God your problems, to just tell him all of your fears, all of your sorrows, to submit all of that to him. And then to remember all of his faithfulness to you in the past. And as you do that, he'll give you what you need to endure your sorrows well. And even to emerge through them uh, unbroken and, and victorious. He, our God is always so willing to hear. Always so willing to help. Always so willing to give us the guidance we need, the guidance we cry out for. In contrast to that faithless king, we see a faithful prophet in verse eight. But, but when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king saying, why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me that he may know that there's a prophet in Israel. So Elisha understands, he sees here that the king is behaving like a faithless coward. And so he decides that he better take over the situation. So he says, let Naaman come to me so that he may know there's a prophet in Israel. And we wonder, why does Naaman need to know that there's a prophet in Israel? What does that knowledge do for him? Well, if there's a prophet in Israel, there's a God in Israel. Because when a prophet speaks, God speaks. If there's a prophet who's acting, there's a God who's acting through that prophet. And so Elisha sees an opportunity here. He can display the power of God. He can display the power of God to his own people. He can display the power of God to this man Naaman and the people who are with him. Verse nine. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. It's kind of fun to imagine this big group of people coming to a stop outside Elisha's little home, you know, with great pomp and circumstance, a spokesman announces, the mighty Naaman is here, and he stands there. He can, you know, gets off his chariot, and he stands there waiting for Elisha to come out of his house and no doubt to, to bow down before him and, of course, to heal him. That's not exactly how it goes, though. Verse 10, and Elisha sent a messenger to him. Elisha doesn't go himself. Instead, he sends a mere servant. And his servant passes along a little message. He says, go and wash in the Jordan River seven times, and your flesh will be restored, and you'll be clean. Interesting. And how, how does Naaman receive this instruction? <laughs> Not very well. He's pretty upset about it. Verse 11, but Naaman was angry and went away saying, behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be clean? So he turned and he went away in a rage. Couple questions. Why does Elisha send a servant instead of going himself? And why does Naaman get so angry at this? Well, to the first question, why send a servant? I guess Elisha's making a point. He's making sure Naaman knows that when healing comes, it's the work of God. It's not the work of any man. He needs Naaman to know that. It's nothing to do with Elisha. It's everything to do with the God of Elisha. Now, 
This contrasts a lot with what we tend to see in this world. If you ever see a faith healer on TV, and to be clear, I don't recommend that you do, if you ever see a faith healer on TV, I guarantee he will not show that kind of humility. I also guarantee he won't actually heal you, but he'll tell you that you're healed, and he'll make a big production of it. He'll, he'll wave his hands, and he'll probably speak in some gibberish tongue, and he'll push you over. He'll make absolutely certain that through it all, he is front and he is center. He's the one that everybody sees and everybody glorifies, right? Benny Hinn wants to heal you on the stage, so he receives the glory and he receives the money. Elisha wants this man to be healed in isolation. Why? So God receives the glory, and nobody but God receives the glory. So the first question, why does Elisha send a servant instead of going himself? So there's no confusion. If healing comes or when healing comes, nobody will give Elisha the glory. It'll go to God alone. The second question, why does Naaman get so angry? Well, in part because his pride is wounded, right? He's, he's embarrassed. He's affronted by the way he's been treated here. Uh, maybe you can imagine that somehow through the week, your, your church here, that you get an email saying that some Hollywood bigwig celebrity person is going to be visiting your church the next Sunday. Right, so he's going to be coming here, right, to this building to worship with you. Sunday morning, he rolls up in the, the back of a big old stretched SUV, and his security people open the door for him and help him down, and he strolls to the front door of the church, and he gets the exact same treatment as everybody else. He gets the same greeting as everyone else. He sits in the same seats as everyone else. He's treated the same as everybody You've probably heard of these celebrity churches that have VIP areas for the celebs who come in. That is, that is nonsense. That is evil. We don't treat people better on the basis of what they've done. But if you do, if you're just telling him, take your seat, just worship along with the rest of us, he might get angry. Why would he get angry? Because people usually treat him like his fame and his awards and his power and his notoriety, like all of that somehow sets him above the rest of us. But then he walks into a church and he's just another sinner in need of grace. No better, no worse than anyone else who walks into this place. And so Naaman was angry that he's not being treated like a VIP. He thinks he's deserving. He's entitled to that kind of treatment. But I think he was also angry that the solution he was offered here was so unexpected, so simplistic, so insulting even. Elisha's servant said, just here's what you need to do. I know you've got this terrible disease. I know you've tried everything. Here's what you need to do. Go to the Jordan River and just dip yourself in the river seven times. That's all you have to do. Turns out Naaman's not a big fan of the Jordan River. He knows there are nicer rivers in his own country. And really, if it was that simple, just dip yourself in a river seven times, he could have saved a lot of time, a lot of bother, just gone into the rivers in his own backyard and be done with it. And so Naaman, he's angry, he's embarrassed, he's muttering under his breath, he storms off. Just what a total waste of his time and how embarrassing this whole thing has been. I wonder if you, like me, have seen people show interest in the Christian faith before. They listen respectfully when they're told about humanity's problem with sin. Like, yeah, I can see that. I've done some bad things. And they maybe even continue to listen with interest as you tell them about Jesus Christ dying on the cross for the sins of humanity. And they think, yeah, what a great man that he would take people's place. And maybe they've asked, well, what do I need to do to become a Christian? And he said, it's, it's so simple. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And maybe you've seen them respond essentially like Naaman. They scoffed or they rolled their eyes or they just kind of were no longer interested or walked away. Why? Because grace is so offensive. They expected that somewhere along the line you would tell them how to earn their salvation. And they wanted to earn their salvation. We all want to earn our salvation. That's our natural inclination. Tell me what I need to do 
Tell me how I can fix this thing. Tell me how I can overcome it through my own power, my own strength. They wanted to earn their salvation. They didn't want to receive it by grace. They wanted to receive it by their own works. They wanted their salvation to be deserved instead of undeserved. And so instead of accepting Christ, they rejected Christ. See, I think that if Elisha had told Naaman to do something hard or do something heroic, I think he would have been fine with it, like climb a mountain or swim a sea or fight a dragon or something like that, right? Go and do something heroic, and Naaman would have said, good, I'll do it. But he was told to do something simple, something that proved beyond any shadow of a doubt it had nothing to do with him. He wasn't earning it. He would only be receiving it by grace. It would be a gift. And he didn't like the solution one little bit. And so he stormed off in a rage. And that, by right, should be the end of the story. Naaman goes back to Syria, and he dies of leprosy, the end. But thankfully, even though Norman do, uh, Naaman does storm away, he can't storm beyond the reach of God. I wonder how many of you, at first, stormed away from God. When you heard the message of salvation, you at first stormed away only to find that you couldn't outrun God. He was going to pursue you. How many ran away and found that God patiently and gently drew you back to himself? See, God has a plan for Naaman. He's not going to let him just run away. He won't let him get away. So added to our big man and our little girl, to our faithless king and our faithful prophet, we now meet this kind and powerful God. Verse 13. But his servants came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, Wash and be clean? So what Naaman's servants here do is they appeal to him by breaking it down so it's super simple for him. You've got a bad disease. This man has offered a solution. Don't you think you should at least give it a shot? Is it really that big a deal to give it a try? And wisely... Naaman listens to his servants. It's interesting to think that in this story, first it's a little girl, a powerless little girl who redirects this big and powerful man. And then it's these servants, powerless servants who redirect this big and powerful man. God is using these little people to steer this mighty man. Verse 14, so he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according to the word of the man of God and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child and he was clean. So God works a miracle. This kind God displays his power by healing Naaman from his disease. And this kind God shows his mercy, his, his mercy because Naaman had done absolutely nothing to deserve this. In fact, he was an enemy of God. He was an enemy of God's people. He had oppressed God's people, yet God reached out to him and God saved him, God healed him. It's worth asking, what does Naaman need to do to be healed? What does he need to do to be saved from his leprosy? And, and you know as well as I do, he's taken all sorts of pills and endured all kinds of treatments. He's tried everything that's available to him. In the end, what finally works? What does he need to do to be healed? Well, first, he has to believe the word that was spoken to him. It sounded crazy. It sounded simplistic. It sounded like it couldn't possibly be true. He has to hear it. He has to believe it. Second, he has to humble himself, right? He has to step down from his chariot. He has to take off all the symbols of his power and his might and his wealth. And he has to walk down into this very ordinary river. If he's going to be cured, it'll take belief rather than doubt. And it'll take humility rather than pride. And then third, it will take obedience instead of defiance. He has to wash it's not enough for Naaman just to look at the water or to dabble in the water or to splash a little bit in the water. He has to do exactly as he's been told. He has to dunk himself under the water seven times. And you know in the Bible, seven is, is a number that represents completion, represents perfection. And when he has fully obeyed, he is fully cured. When he emerges the seventh time, he's basically a whole new man. It says, his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. It's almost like he's reborn. He goes into that water scarred and scabbed and disfigured and 
near death. He emerges from the water healed and restored and completely unblemished, better than new. So God works a miracle. God saves Naaman from his disease. He displays his kindness toward this man. He displays his power. We need to consider what this account meant to the people of Israel. This account happened thousands of years ago. It was written down thousands of years ago. What did it mean to them then? That's always a good question to ask before we start to think about what it can mean to us now. What did it mean to them then who first heard the story, first experienced it? What proved to them that the God who has power to heal a body has the power to deliver his people from their enemies? It must have been greatly encouraging for them to see the power of God. And also, if you were to continue to read the story, you'd see that Naaman becomes a worshiper of Israel's God. So here God saves a man who's not just a foreigner. He is an enemy. He's a sworn enemy of God's. And God saves him. And he's proving right here that his salvation reaches across national boundaries, reaches across ethnic boundaries, because that was his plan all along, not just to save his ethnic people of Israel, but to save people from all places, all tribes, all languages. So this was history, a true story that actually happened to true people. It was history that blessed God's people, that instructed them and encouraged them. Then as we wrap up, we should ask this then, what should this account mean to you? We live thousands of years later in a completely different culture, a completely different place. These are foreign names to us, foreign places. What should it mean to you? Well, it can encourage you in those same ways, of course, that God is powerful and that God is sovereign and God has his people in a host of places, nations, ethnicities. We praise God for that. We praise God that his salvation has gone out to Gentiles, to people like you and like me. And if you're a Christian, you should consider that just like God healed Naaman's body so it was cured and restored and unblemished, he does the same for your soul. When he saves your soul, he heals your soul. And of course, baptism is just such a beautiful picture of this. Right? Just think about what Naaman did and think about what baptism is. We're buried with Christ in his death, raised to walk a new life. Diseased, restored, corrupted, renewed. What a great work God did in Naaman. And what a great work he's done in you and me. And then displayed the work he's done through that beautiful picture of baptism. And then whether you're a Christian or not, I think it's worth asking this. What did Syria ever really do for Naaman? And what has this world ever really done for you? What has this world ever given that delivers lasting satisfaction? Or that addresses your deepest needs, your soul needs? Right, this world can give you fame, but Fame is fleeting, you know that, you've seen that. This world can give you money, but money's easy to lose and you certainly can't take it with you. This world can give you health, it can give you beauty, but the day will come when you'll be as sick and as weak and as close to death as Naaman was, that's inevitable. A friend of mine recently came down to his last few days on earth, I told you a little bit about him on Friday evening. He was a very successful and well-known man in the world of business. Christian organizations pleaded with him, be on our board of directors. He was that kind of person. He had earned the respect of so many people and he had so much. Like Naaman, a lot of people would look at this man and say he had it all. He was living the life. He had all that, that I want and if I had it, I would be at last content. But also like Naaman, he had one thing that we all dread he had a fatal disease. And as he came to his final days, I, I talked with him and I asked him, what's on your heart? What are you learning through this time? And as you approach the end, what are you pondering? He said this, I've learned that God wants me to be free of anything in this world. What I came in with is what I'll leave with. And that's really nothing but him, nothing but the mercy and grace of God. 
I'm no longer a CEO. I no longer have a fancy title. I'm no longer part of a board of directors. I'm just a man who has to submit to God's good and gracious will and just be faithful to him. And he said this, when you've stored up your treasures in heaven, it makes it so much easier to leave this world behind. This world gave my friend so much. But in the end, he left with none of it. He left empty-handed. But he did leave with his faith. And he did leave with his Savior. And he did leave with the strongest and firmest hope that anyone can have. And so I ask, what has this world ever really done for you? What hope does this world offer you when, when your time comes to leave it? And so I hope this account here, this, this story can remind us that this world ultimately disappoints. And that the way to live a fulfilled life on this side of the grave and the way to have true and lasting hope on the other side of the grave requires the same thing. Just as Naaman needed to find a cure that came from outside of himself and a cure that came from beyond the borders of Syria, you need to look beyond yourself and you need to look beyond the borders of this world. There's just one trustworthy guide for humanity that comes from outside this world. You've got it in your hand. <laughs> it comes from the mind of the God who created this world, this Bible. This Bible is meant to teach you how to live here and now and how to have true hope for what comes beyond here and now. And the best life, I tell you, I've seen it, I've witnessed it in the lives of so many. The best life is the life that's lived to believing this and obeying this and living like it's true, just trusting God as he speaks in his word. And that Bible tells us Christ came from outside this world to save this world. Even though he's God, he became human so he could redeem humans. And he offers salvation to anyone who will believe in him, anyone who will believe in his name. And in his own way, Naaman shows us how, like him. You need to he hear and believe the word that's been spoken to you. And you need to set aside your desire to save yourself and instead receive salvation as a gift of grace. And you need to obey God, to obey him all the way. God doesn't tell you to dip yourself in a river seven times. He tells you to repent and believe. To confess that you're a sinner. And to believe that Jesus died to save sinners. Sinners like me. Sinners like you. Sinners like Naaman and Elisha. God doesn't tell you to try. He tells you to trust. So don't try to save yourself. Trust that he can and will and would be delighted to save you. So why wouldn't you do that? It's as easy as believing. And if you do, you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll find your soul satisfied by something that can never ever be taken from you. And that's God himself. God himself will satisfy your soul. If you do that, you'll find hope that extends way beyond this world and into the endless ages beyond. If you, if you receive Christ, you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be as healed and blessed in your soul as this man Naaman was in his body. Let me pray that God would make it so. Our Father, we thank you that you give us your word to instruct us, to show us who you are, and to show us how we're to live in this world in a way that brings you honor and glory. We thank you that you saved Naaman, and in saving him, you gave us just a beautiful illustration of how you save us. Pray that there would not be one person who leaves here today without trusting in Christ and receiving his salvation as a free gift, the best gift we can ever receive. So thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for all you've done, all the ways you bring glory to your name. It's in the name of Christ our Savior we pray.